Hello, I'm Stephen Alltop, and it's my pleasure to share with you this little preview of the upcoming season opening concert of the Champaign-Urbana Symphony Orchestra on Saturday, October 1st at 7.30 p.m. in the Follinger Great Hall at the Craner Center. Our program will feature wonderful music, both new and old. The first piece on the concert is the Violin Concerto by the Persian composer Bejad Ranjbaran. Ranjbaran came to the United States at the age of 19 in 1974 to study. Today he serves on the faculty of the Juilliard School in New York. Now I know how it is when there's a composer on a program and you might not know their name and you wonder, will I like this music? I think you're going to really enjoy this piece of music. Ranjbaran's style is rooted in traditional harmony with influences of Persian culture. Listen to this excerpt from the first movement. And this passage from the same movement that hints at Persian influence. One thing I really love about this concerto is the powerful role that the orchestra plays in the interjections it makes into the music and the way it supports the solo violin line. Our soloist will be the fabulous violinist Alyssa Kolyonen. Here's a brief excerpt of her tremendous artistry. I'm thrilled to have Alyssa back in Champaign, in part because she was the soloist on my very first concert as music director 10 years ago. Yes, can you believe it's been 10 years? But also I'm thrilled because between her last visit and now, Alyssa had a very serious bout with cancer, and I'm so glad to say that she's overcome that. I recently did a presentation on the sustaining and healing power of music. And Alyssa was kind enough to share some about her own relationship to music during this most trying time. At first, I just, you know, kind of shut down to everything. You know, when I had my diagnosis, I, and, and music, I mean, everything except my family. I was just, you know, I didn't know what to expect because it was just such a, a shock, it completely out of the blue, as it always is for people. Um, I'd always been very, very healthy. So I just, I could not believe it. I thought they must've made a mistake. So, but you know, I know that um, it would have been maybe in hindsight, it would have been ideal if I could have come home that day and just turned to my music and my violin and found comfort, but that was hardly what it was for me. I just kind of shut, shut down. Um, so I think I actually went, I mean, everything rolled along very quickly. So as soon as I had the diagnosis, I had to schedule surgery and figure out when chemo is happening and all that. And so there was no reason I couldn't practice or think about music, but I honestly just didn't. Um, so initially, no. 
Yeah. Um, and, and then after I had the surgery three weeks, three, four weeks later, I realized, oh, I should have practiced because now I can't practice for the next three, four months because I couldn't raise my arms. Um, but I realized in hindsight that I really like was constantly thinking about it. And I was literally practicing in my head all the time without even consciously, you know, being aware of it. And um, b- by doing so, like, I was so excited to like come back to, to playing and um, it, I realized that I, it definitely, um, I, I definitely felt like it impacted how I returned to my music and my interpretations of, of pieces. And I constantly listened, you know, to music and found great, great comfort in, um, in everything that I listened to, not just, you know, violin playing, but music all around. But there was a little reservation of, of uh, just thinking like, gosh, if I can't do this, if I can't do it the way I want to do it, I just, I just don't want to be, you know, do this because it's just too upsetting to remember. But then I, I realized that it was a really great way for me to go back to my former invincible me. <laughs> you know? uh, and it, it really, it, it did provide that, you know, comfort for me. And, and yes, I definitely felt like when I came back, not only physically and technically, I had to sort of start from scratch um, because I hadn't played for so long. Surprisingly, it really came back um, faster than I thought it would. But it was a really great way to reset and just reset my technical wishes and, and also my interpretations and add to the element of, of my life uh, learnings, <laughs> and, you know, realizing that, you know, I could have not been here, but I'm here. So I get to play this incredible music that I always appreciated, but not to this degree as I did then and now, you know. The second half of our concert will be the Brahms Symphony No. 1. It was Robert Schumann who, in October of 1853, published an article entitled Neue Bahnen, or New Paths, in which he proclaimed the then 20-year-old Johannes Brahms as a new hero of music. Now, Brahms was barely known then, But Schumann surmised that it was Brahms who would become the great new compositional voice. And while this certainly helped Brahms become better known, it also placed a huge burden on his shoulders, which is generally why it's thought that Brahms took 20 years to produce his first symphony, 20 years later than after this article. In fact, he worked on it on and off for 14 years before the music was finally premiered in 1876. The first movement announces itself in epic proportions with a penetrated thrumming of six beats to the bar in the timpani. From the very beginning, the music grabs us with riveting tension. next rather suspenseful music draws its inspiration from those very repeated notes that open the symphony in the timpani, but now they're sort of moving around to different harmonies. So remember those repeated notes because they're a factor in the other movements to come as well. Um, Then we finally arrive at the main allegro part of the symphony. So it's still sort of agitated and there's a lot of tension. The first movement is really quite big shouldered music indeed. Brahms was one of the greatest vocal composers who ever lived, and even his instrumental music is full of vocal references, mezzo voce, sotto voce, cantabile, and so on. The second and third movements are essentially songs for orchestra. The second movement is a stately andante based on a simple chorale beginning. Now you may have noticed 
noticed that there are repeated notes in that. And you might say, well, there are repeated notes in most music. But in the case of Brahms, it's rather intentional because it's part of his whole construction. One of the most beautiful passages in all of Brahms' symphonies comes at the end of the second movement, when the solo violin soars one octave above the other strings. It just takes your breath away. It's so beautiful. The third movement conveys a more carefree mood, at least at the beginning. So it is still essentially a song, especially in the beautiful orchestration that Brahms uses. One of the amazing things about Brahms is how, like Beethoven, he could build huge structures using the smallest rhythmic and melodic elements, called motives. One example would be in the second part of this third movement, when we hear the repeated notes, the same ones that we heard at the beginning of the symphony, but now in a different guise, but still related. It's in a new context, but still linking all the movements together with similar elements. The final movement begins with great mystery and uncertainty. continues with several elements that sustain that uncertainty. A game of sort of cat and mouse between the strings and then some very rhapsodic scales, uh, particularly in the lower strings, before we finally arrive at a passage that seems to be reflective of alpine beauty. This features solos for the flute, trumpet, and horn. vistas that so inspired Brahms in his composition. He would go to the mountains in the summer to do a lot of his composing, particularly symphonic composing. This is followed by a chorale played by the trombones that really seems to reverence the beauty of nature itself. One of my favorite passages, particularly, I think that E flat is my favorite note in the whole symphony. And this material all comes back just before the really exciting energetic conclusion of the symphony. He brings it back in an even grander guise and context. And then the conclusion really might remind you from, of the end of Beethoven's Symphony Number no. 5. Last but not least, I'll just mention the main tune of the main part of this last movement. It is one of the most beautiful hymn-like songs, if you will, that we ever hear in symphonic music.
really makes you want to sing while you play. You can always listen to this music on a recording, but there is nothing that compares to hearing and seeing it live, feeling the exertion and the energy of the musicians, feeling the vibration of sound as it takes flight in a great acoustical space. Nothing like it. So, hope you have enjoyed this little preview and that we will see you there in the Follinger Great Hall on Saturday, October 1st.